to the 18th episode of the fifth season of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It is Tuesday the 23rd of October and in this episode we are going to talk about Canonical's new secret projects idea and hear another interview from Skycon, this time with the Linux kernel developer Wolfram Sang. We will of course cover the latest news, events, a bit about Ubuntu, tomorrow's technology today and go over your feedback. If you're listening live you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. Oh it's smashy and nicey. In... <laughs> I am Tony, and joining me tonight, well, there are just two other people here in the uh, lovely Ubuntu UK podcast studio. Um, there's no Alan this week because he is sunning himself in Copenhagen. Um, <laughs> and eating in, lots of pastries. Enjoying uh, very expensive beers and staying in a hotel room um, which has a clear <laughs> glass shower cubicle in the corner of it, apparently. Bathroom cubicle, I think. Ideally suited. Not staying by himself. Sharing no, a room, sharing yeah. a room. Ideally suited for a geek conference. <laughs> <laughs> clear Ooh. glass shower cubicles but braving the uh slightly warm weather here um, in uh england is laura and mark hello. hello so mark how are you i'm all right thank you tony oh good i'm glad to hear that what have you been doing since i saw you last um i've been doing a bit of programming ah interesting anything interesting about that um <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, cracking interviews guys uh i've been writing some well basically i've had an idea for a while where i want to write a zero player game sorry what uh, which is a game where basically you sort of set up the initial state of the game and then you say okay i'm done and then it plays the game for you which um does it save you all the tedious mucking around in basically so i mean i mean one classic one which people might know about is the game of life right where you set up some blobs and they according to a predefined rule set they evolve and change and die and grow yeah but then people have made more complicated ones like there's a game called progress quest where you set up an rpg character and then it does all the fighting monsters getting loot selling the loot leveling up and so on for you so basically, I thought it would be fun to do one of those as an exercise. And how does it go? It's kind of like Championship Manager. Yeah, in except, principle. Yeah, yeah, same sort of thing, except you don't, you know, it will trade the players for you and play the games for you. That dates me, doesn't it? Hmm. That'd be like 97. So, so what's your game about? <laughs> um, not a lot yet. I've basically right. just been working on the, the basics of it and what I'm going to use and how I'm going to build it and how I'm going to make sure it actually works. So I've been doing, I've decided to write in JavaScript because I've never really written okay. anything that big in javascript before so i'm getting mm. used to doing things like unit testing with javascript and um coffee script which is a way of making it easier to write javascript you do know that you're now going to get lots of emails in telling you which program language you should use well they can all go and write their own game <laughs> it's just a shame that you can't find a uh, zero player game that writes itself as well and saves you the bother in the first place hmm Strokes beard. Strokes beard. Yeah, but this, this isn't designed to be actually something which people download and play, really. This is just something to keep me amused. Fair enough. Laura. Hello. What have you been up to? I went to a symposium. Ooh. Ooh. What's one of those? Well, I just looked it up. <laughs> and apparently it means a series of talks on a particular subject, which is about right. What was the particular subject? Um, history of psychology. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I find quite interesting. And yeah, so things like the history of how we have explained away tears and crying, whether it's biological or psychological. Or and alcohol. Just got something in your eyes. <laughs> exactly. Um, and the history of the lie detector. Ooh. Which is quite interesting. Or was it? Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there we go. So yes, that was me. Excellent. And what have you been up to, Tony? Oh, well, very kind of you to ask, Mark. Um, oh, well, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> now, go on. Um, I, oh, I saw uh, Alice Roberts from Time Team and uh, lots of other BBC shows as well. Um, Time Team isn't a BBC yes, show. Uh, from Time Team and lots of other oh, BBC I see. shows. Right. Sorry. Okay. I'll say that again. Um, yeah, doing a, a lecture. She was talking about the megafauna of the uh, Paleolithic era and what happened to them and things. It was oh, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're megafauna. Anything over 30 kilograms is megafauna. I see. So you're, you're a megafauna and you're a megafauna. How dare you? You're talking into a megafauna. That's a microphone. Oh, megafauna. As the Italians say. <laughs> oh, at the, this symposium oh, yeah. I was at, um, we had a man with the audience mic called Mike. Oh, We've no. got to get us one of those for our camp. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, well, thanks for sharing. Let's get on with the show. <laughs> Shuttleworth wrote a blog post and lots of people commented on it and then he wrote another one and they commented some more. Sounds most unusual. <laughs> um, wow. This is about um, the Skunk Works project idea. Oh, okay. um, What's a Skunk Works? Well, somebody commented on this. <laughs> uh, apparently a Skunk Works project is generally a project that's sort of off to one side away from main development mm-hmm. and not very open. So it's possibly a bad term to use because this is basically when they get toward you know like we get certain things coming out at the end of a release uh, you know just before a release yeah like Like a shopping lens shopping lens (laughs) yes or buttons or whatever yeah um (laughs) don't write in um (laughs) the thing is canonical tends to work on those things personally privately yeah and nobody else is involved so what they're thinking is making those more open but obviously keeping the secret surprise Mm-hmm. for fun um and the people who and so trusted people basically members who've shown themselves to work hard and be trusted in the past um can join in those projects and um yes take part in the fun and how was it received this suggestion of a of a newfound openness and cooperation with the community mixed right okay <laughs> literally i mean there are some really positive comments like this is a great idea and things right. like oh how do i get involved i'd really like to do this mm. and then not so positive ideas so okay. what are the, the what are the um the reasons which people don't like the sound of this well am Stop i the only one who's read this <laughs> no but you're the segment starter so oh yeah you get to do all the explanation okay alan's fair. not here so somebody's got to do it <laughs> um so I think some of it is that it's called secret or skunk works, which gives people an impression of not being open. Right. Um, there's the idea that, or somebody accused it of being an over the fence source project. Okay. What do you mean by that? Where, well, Novell's allegedly done this. This is where you, you sort of, you develop <laughs> yeah. something internally and then you say, oh, there you go. It's open, it's open source, source now. We've done our bit. And like gen- eye folder. Yes. yes, things like that, and then and then don't, don't do anything. Do, do anything. Don't maintain it. Don't. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Which doesn't seem entirely accurate here because they will carry on yeah. maintaining it because it's still part. It's going to be the part project. of Ubuntu. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, there's that sort of thing. There's just general feeling. I think that it's not very open just to have these secret projects at all because uh, obviously people miss out on um, seeing the development and the evolution of the the yeah features mm. so mark even followed it up with a, a subsequent blog post to clarify uh, the following day after his original one to clarify uh, what he meant and it seems that being his first blog post was really kind of upbeat and yeah. uh, chirpy and you know vaguely amusing and uh, the second blog post was slightly more disappointed and grumpy and acerbic <laughs> um Sort of saying things like um, it doesn't in any way suggest that um, the uh, the process is closing down the openness of Ubuntu. Mm. Um, you know, it's opening up the closed bits, hopefully. The yeah. secret bits. Yeah, you know, it's it's makes it more transparent, not less transparent, um, and gives people a chance to be involved in something they weren't involved in before. Now. It sort of predisposes that you accept the argument that these things should exist in the first place. Yeah. Yes. But he does make the point, um, there's confidential work that happens in every company-sponsored mm. distro, and this is personal work that's revealed when it's ready in a non-company distro. Yeah, so in non-company-sponsored mm. distros, people do these things anyway, but just personally. Um, so what he's offering to do is the stuff that Canonical does privately yeah to make them involved so it's actually opening it up but they're not doing anything different from anybody else Mm. yes in fact he even says you know an individual hacker unless they're you know literally uploading every line of code (laughs) yeah to a repository as they write it to a certain extent does some work and then makes it available for other people to look Mm. at yeah dumps that over the wall if you like um so yeah i mean it's an interest i wonder whether it is a a direct um response to the people who have accused canonical of being too closed in some of their development 
uh, in the last, I don't know, three years or so. Yeah. Um, as we've seen things like Unity uh, and like the work of the design team and, um, you know, some of the decisions made around that that arguably had that, that hadn't had a lot of say, hadn't had a lot of input from you know, the wider community. They were just delivered perhaps just before or just after the freeze the freeze window mm. so do you think that this is just trying to pay lip service to the community's needs in terms of say oh look we had these people from the community therefore it's not just canonical or do you think they they're hoping that actually having these community people on board will make it a better project which will serve the community better in the long run i think they hope it will have voices in the community speaking up for these features mm. that aren't canonical employees. Yeah. Buy in. Yeah. So, you know, it's great if something is announced and Mark writes about it and Jono writes about it. But if you've actually got people from the community who don't have a, a vested interest yeah. in uh, the progress of Ubuntu beyond their own contributions to it, they don't have a, a commercial interest, say, well, even then mm. some companies could have if they're a support organization. But that yeah, they're not canonical, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Then it helps to pe- people to say, actually, you know, I was involved in this. You know, the intentions were good, or the intentions were, you know, um, <laughs> well uh, were, domination <laughs> were, on, were honourable, and you know, we designed this and we thought about this, that, and the other, and mm. you know, there's another voice in the community to help support it. And there were several comments of people saying, "How do I get involved?" It sounds like a great idea, and I mean, for some people, it's it'd be really good sort of work experience if you like. Mm. Um, getting stuff on your cv you can say you did this and um, also just sort of kudos in the community yeah i mean you got you were part of that buzz yeah though he does say something like strap the teflon on before you start yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's interesting i wonder what sort of backlash um, mark was anticipating when he wrote that mm. well, for the individual developers and that yeah yeah because, well i was gonna I, say because if you're associated with a feature that everybody whinges about well, it could yeah, depress um, you a I, bit. I, I don't think, yeah, it's maybe not that everyone whinges about. I think it might just be that he's very conscious that there's always some people who are going to say, oh, this is bad for this reason. And if you're going to get involved in something which is going to be public and going to be, you know, made a fuss of when it's released, then you have to be prepared for, you know, both sides. The, yeah. You've got to be prepared for the you know, the handful of people who are going to be very vocally against anything and you know let that slide because there's hopefully going to be a lot of people who are maybe less vocally but supportive of it and Mm -hmm. happy that it's there yeah yeah so should we accept that these skunk works projects are the right way to do it at all well i think that it's fair to say they're going to happen anyway yeah, so yeah. it doesn't it doesn't mean we can't express an opinion about oh, it. Well, I mean, yeah, you know, is the ideal to have all development, every idea, every little trial of something or other, you know, available in a public repository, or you know, that people can see and try and find out? That's the open source uh, ideal, surely. Yeah, I suppose so. I think, yeah, ultimately, that would be wonderful. But if you if they're trying to get a commercial edge on it, the then. You know, that's that's why they're doing it, so that they have something they can go, ha, this is what we're doing, this release, and you can't beat me to it. Some secrets and some surprises. Yeah, some mm. f- secret features. And it also gets them the marketing buzz. I think some commenter pointed that out. It's a marketing thing as right. well. Um, I suppose, yeah, then you've got you've got the point at which people all blog about it at once rather exactly. than... Uh, we've we've committed some code to this repository every yeah. <laughs> every day for the past month, and we've now got something usable, Yeah, and everyone's forgotten about it. Also, I guess there's a, there's a risk of um, if you put something up and it is a dodgy build or it just doesn't work yeah. very well, people will write it off before they've even tried it. Yes. Or if they've yeah they've tried a a feature a certain way and it doesn't really work that way. Yeah. Like for instance, with the shopping lens, maybe if they you know they'd done a, a release early and it had been even worse <laughs> than, than people thought it was when it was released. Um, you know, and then they would have just completely written it off altogether before they got a chance to fix it. Hmm. I think some sometimes, um, okay, with the shopping lens and the privacy issues and stuff, I can see you could say yes or no, or that could influence it. Some of the other things are more subtle design decisions. And first of all, if you have loads and loads of people involved in the design, it really inhibits yes. what you can actually come up with. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also, you shouldn't be designing by committee because you end up with just a monster. Hmm. Um, you could, you know, if you, I think if you give people enough time to criticize everything, 
the, the design team or whoever will get completely worn down by all the criticism and then lose sight of what they're actually trying to achieve because they're trying to satisfy everyone i've certainly seen it before where there's been a discussion about a very specific thing and there's just been so many opinions that no decision could ever possibly be made about it yeah so that said if you've if you've got a good process to manage it you can still do that in an open way Mm. rather than having it have to be secret it's just a case of having the right people who it's yeah, elephant the, thick yeah. skin and yeah and, no, and the well the people who will say you know right i've listened to enough opinions that this is what we're going to do before it gets out of hand yeah and one of the things that mark makes very clear is they're looking for people with sort of proven skills in certain areas mm. Mm. it's not just somebody saying oh i fancy a go at design yeah G- <laughs> give me a whiteboard and a crayon and a, you know, <laughs> let me at it yeah it, they're looking for people who've got uh skills in their in their area whether it's crypto whether it's design whether it's mm. you know some sort of fundamental kernel architecture thing cloud stuff whatever it might be um so uh, there's obviously going to be questions around who gets in and who gets out and you know how should you be just looking for people who've currently got the skills or people who are perhaps just interested born to develop skills and you know all sorts of things spring to mind around that um but it's not just going to be you know un uh, inexperienced keen people Mm. um volunteering to you know design the next version of unity or whatever yeah and one of the comments on um rsc from saberwolf is that People are working all the time really hard on bug fixes and the standard features mm. and you shouldn't take too much of the focus away from those people who are also doing good work just mm. because they're not doing the glamorous, sexy work. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because it will be those skunk works projects, as they will no doubt be known, um, that that get all the attention. And, you know, the fact that somebody's working very hard fixing LibreOffice, <laughs> um, you know, bugs in LibreOffice, is yeah. not going to get a lot of uh, attention and praise. But people don't always do it for attention and yeah, praise. Yeah, I was going to say, if if there was no canonical Skunkworks projects, the people doing LibreOffice bugs still wouldn't got to get a lot of attention and praise. It's, <laughs> no. it's not a zero-sum game like that, unfortunately. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, or fortunately. <laughs> indeed. Uh, Super Engineer uh, asks, uh, hopefully rhetorically, um, having announced it will happen, uh, which he doesn't see as a bad thing, will announcements be made on the progress? of said skunk works well p- presumably the whole point of them is that you won't know they're going to happen mm. until, until they, they do, do land yeah i mean we've got some vague ideas of the areas they're in yeah but well, we, we know for example that there's work being going on on t- tv and you yeah know, mobile tablets that sort of thing but nobody outside of canonical has seen um the tv interface has been previewed but uh, the uh, mobile and tablet stuff hasn't been seen by mm. anybody outside canonical so uh, yeah, that's the sort of thing that they were talking about doing, presumably. And one of the sort of nice small parts is that um, they're not expecting community people to do NDAs. Oh, um, yes. So they don't have to do non-disclosure yeah. agreements. Um, they're just trusted, basically. Mm. That's why they're looking for people who have a proven record. Yeah, I thought that was a really nice uh, way of, of handling it. It always gets difficult when people have to sign NDAs, particularly if they are just volunteers yeah. helping out for this sort yeah. of thing. And it's also interesting as to what sort of aspects they can get involved in. Uh, are, are they going to be, say you are developing I don't know, a feature, uh, are you going to be able to contribute code? Are you contributing ideas? Are you just giving feedback yeah, and reviewing absurd, what they've done and giving feedback? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, what sort of level can you get involved in in these things? I think it did say something about coding. Um, you have to be able to get down and do some right. coding reliably and okay. that, that's testable and well tested and that. So presumably quite involved. Mm. Um and i can't remember what i was gonna say no that's fair enough <laughs> cool well if you're <laughs> listening at home and you've got some thoughts on the uh shuttleworth skunk works project that's what we're <laughs> gonna call them um send in your feedback to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or you can get in touch using any one of the number of mechanisms that we talk about on our website podcast.ubuntu-uk.org and at the end of the show And now it's time for the news. The Secure secure Boot saga continues with Matthew Garrett responding to the Linux Foundation's proposed solution with derision. 
that sums it up. <laughs> he is the most chilled man in Linux. No. <laughs> Garrett suggests that the Foundation's proposal treats Linux as a second-class citizen and is much less preferable than the solution being implemented by Suze and Fedora. Yes, because the uh, Suze and Fedora solution... <laughs> Sorry, I fell it's asleep. It's bootloaders. This stuff's important. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of them has a nice UI and one of them can't reboot by itself. One, of, Yeah. And, but one <laughs> of them is a, is a one-off thing you do during the install. Yeah, which is okay. To authorise it, yeah. and which is the Susan Fedora one. And the other one means you have to hit yes every time you want to boot your PC. That would be a nine. Which is what the Linux Foundation are coming forward. So uh, I agree with Matt Garrett on this one. It seems to be a suboptimal solution. Although, you know, swings and roundabouts in all cases. The Linaro project has created a tool designed to build boot time monitoring into the Linux kernel. Yeah, my booting. The tool, <laughs> oh, hit Y. The tool, <laughs> appropriately named Boot Time, is hoped to be included in the mainline kernel and will render standalone boot tools like Boot Chart obsolete. What? Sorry. It's benchmarking. Yeah, and Boot profiling Chart was a well. thing you could you could add a special grub entry where if you booted using that grub entry, it would make a nice graph of how quickly all of your processes started. I remember. Yes. Yes. That was quite cool. So yeah. this is basically, instead of doing that, you'll just have um, a node on your file system where you can just say, tell me how long it took my system to boot, and it will tell you. And which bits took up what most time. And I guess so, yeah. yeah. Mozilla has published details of security measures in Firefox 17 onwards, which will block outdated versions of popular plugins such as Flash and Adobe Reader from displaying content. If the currently installed version of the plugin has been identified as a security vulnerability, it can be blacklisted, requiring the user to manually run the plugin content by clicking it until the plugin is updated. Does this hit the right level of annoyance for people to actually make them upgrade to the secure version? Um... I don't know. Hmm. Uh, it seems like it could do. It could be just enough uh, annoying enough that they'll go go away and actually find what well, they're yeah, supposed to upgrade and do uh, it. When you see it, it, it's the same sort of display as when the plugin crashes. Like if Flash crashes halfway pl through playing a video and it displays right. a little unhappy face <laughs> and then you have to reload the page or something like that. It's that same sort of screen. So it makes you think, oh, something's broken. I need to fix it. It'd be good if just if clicking it would actually just install a new version. There is there is a link that says, okay. but obviously it depends on what plugin it is and where it comes from as to whether you can have that. This happens facility. to me on a piece of software we have at work, web-based thing, um, and I need to install a new JRE, I think, for it. And it tells me this every time, <laughs> but I hate installing Java. Mm. <laughs> it just all never works. Um, so I just click the button and live with it. Fair mm. enough. Miguel de Casa has announced Mono 3.0, the latest version of the open source implementation of Microsoft's .NET framework. The new release supports numerous behind the scenes improvements as well as some major new features such as support for the .NET asynchronous API and support for Microsoft's open source web frameworks. Oh good. <laughs> Tomboy will work. Well. <laughs> yes, they've enhanced the Tomboy functionality in Mono. Excellent. Brilliant. And after 38 years, the BBC's retro text interface news service, CFAX, will be ending tonight as, as the last analogue transmitter in the country is... Uh, analogue TV transmitter in the country is turned off over in Northern Ireland. Huzzah! Have you ever actually used CFAX, Mark? Uh, I used to use it to look up TV listings when I yeah, was... Yeah, I did. We... I remember we used to play a, com a quiz game on it. Oh, where you, there was there was one button on the remote which was yeah. reveal teletext answer. Oh, something like that. It took forever yeah. for each question to come up. Yeah. But I yeah, the geek aspects of this, the, the reason I included it was that I when I got taught to look, um, taught to program on a BBC Micro, mm. I was doing all different coloured text and backgrounds and realised this is how CFAX is made. <laughs> I could make pages that look like CFAX. Yes, now we have the internet. <laughs> this was before the internet when I was like, guys. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I did my computer badge. <laughs> That's the end of the news. <laughs> but we have some events. Yay. If you're a woman who'd like to get to... <laughs> I'm not quite sure about the phrasing of this, but... <laughs> if you're a woman who'd like to get to grips with open source development in a supportive atmosphere, we, not us, um, the organisers of this event, is this Flossie? Uh, I will don't think so. Oh, um, yeah. Um, yeah. there is an event running uh, 
by Sorry. people as yet unnamed. By people as yet unnamed. Um, an open source taster with three days of tours, talks, and hands on workshops. Um, that's the 29th to the 31st of October at the National Museum of Computing, Bletchley Park. Yay. And, uh, cool. There are still a few tickets left. It is flossy. It is flossy. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you get to make a simple Android app. Uh, yeah. Look at Drew Pal. Look around the museum, of course. And yep. it's just £15 for the whole three days. Which That's quite pretty cool. cheap. That's £5 per day. And Bletchley Park is very cool to visit. Yeah, that's really good value. Mm. Must cost more than that to get in. <laughs> um, and yes. on the 1st of November, in that there London, there's a Red Hat Developer Day. Yes. You can use the discount code Red Hat 20 to get 20% off. I wonder if there's a Red Hat 99 <laughs> discount. You could code. always try it. But yeah, Worth this is. Shot. Um, yeah, Red Hat people showing you about Red Hat technologies. Like, like it's, it's all focused really on sort of cloud stuff. So, doing things like deploying stuff on OpenStack and using their cloud development platforms and things like that. There's other stuff as well. Like, it, yeah. Is that so, a thing like that where that Red Hat sales rep started? Um, slagging off all of the people who are on a conference call is that where, where this happens this sort of thing I'm unaware of that I don't know okay well why don't we uh, listen to tomorrow's technology today and I can tell you okay all about it <laughs> And welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners, wherever you are around the British Empire. As I say to my delightful co-host, Miss Deirdre Morris-Oxford, with what are we going to begin today, Deirdre? We began several hours ago with hypnotherapy, Douglas. Really? I don't remember that. I say, old girl, have you seen my wallet? That's because I hypnotised you, Douglas. Uh, Don't be silly, Deirdre. No one would ever be able to... Sleepy. Wake up! No, no, don't hit me, Father. Oh, what happened? Hypnotherapy, Douglas. You're not banging on about all your weirdy mumbo-jumbo again, Deirdre. What was it last week? Regression therapy. Oh, yes. Hypnotizing people back through past lives. What can anyone learn from past lives? You seem to think you were Florence Nightingale. That was just another nickname from school. You seem to be quite affected by it. You don't understand, Deirdre. Boys can be so cruel. And what about Napoleon? Napoleon was Father's beagle. You wanted to be a beagle dog. Father always loved that beagle more than me. (laughs) Are you all right, Douglas? I never wanted to go away to boarding school. Perhaps you should have a lie down on the couch, Douglas. I can't. I'm not allowed on the couch in case I leave poor marks. You're not a beagle, Douglas. I'm I'm just going to hug myself quietly in this corner. Oh, that's all from tomorrow's technology today. Toodle Pip and God Save the King. Pull yourself together, men. Remember you're British. Skycon with Wolfram Sang from Penguatronics. How are you doing? Oh, fine, thank you very much. Good, good. So you're a kernel developer. How did you get involved in kernel development? Um, I, I do computing since I was a child. I was always I was starting with a Commodore 64, doing very low level stuff, and I really enjoyed that. And I, I wanted to do this a, as a job. And so when when it was due to what do I want to do, what was my job? Uh, I wanted to do low-level computing, and I wanted to do free software development because that's a passion of mine. And so that combination led to uh, embedded Linux development. And you're the maintainer for the I squared C subsystem. What's that about? Uh, that is an industrial bus. It has two wires, and it's pretty slow, but uh, it's pretty uh, efficient to well talk to sensors or what something devices like that and it was the first subsystem i 
uh, Todd uh, came into contact with when I entered uh, Linux kernel development and yeah the maintainer was friendly and uh, guided me into this uh, how to communicate with the kernel community and yeah from that I, I kind of stayed in that subsystem until I took the or well, I was asked to, to, to uh, be a maintainer of that subsystem which I happily do so you've been talking today about people getting involved in kernel development. Uh, there are a lot of developers in the room today when you ask them, um, but a lot of them, none of them had done any kernel development. Why do you think that some people who are experienced developers find it difficult to get into kernel development? Uh, maybe, I think some are afraid because if they do something wrong, I mean, if you have an application going well, then you get a segmentation fall than the application is gone, you restart, but if you do something wrong in the kernel, you get a oops and you have to reboot the machine. Maybe some people are even afraid that they destroy the hardware or, or, or stuff like this. And um, also some people think because it's an operating system, it by definition must be complicated code. And my talk was about that uh, there are core components in the kernel which really are complicated, but there are not enough outside areas which are easy to handle where people can step in and play around with drivers or whatever functionality they need, and that they don't need to be afraid to enter the kernel space. So, so, so the, the idea of, of people finding it difficult to get engaged with kernel development is a bit of a, a myth, you think? It's actually reasonably accessible to get started? Yes, uh, that I, I think it's well. Some kinds are more myth than others, but um, in general, uh, the the kernel is in quite an important part in the, in the uh, free software world, and so there is lots of documentation. You you can get the information you want. There are people around experienced who la like to share their experience. There is lots of infrastructure you can use, like the history of the repository or. Or, or stuff like this. So uh, I think if you want and if you're not afraid, then, then you can get all the help you want to enter the kernel space. And this is really, really wanted because uh, I, I think private participation in the Linux kernel development is very important. There is an idea now that all of the contributions to the kernel, or most of them, come from private companies, you know, from Red Hat or Intel or HP or Canonical or whomever. Um, but you showed some statistics showing that most of the 10% of the changes were coming from hobbyists, I think, in one of the last kernel versions. Um, why is it so important to have hobbyists still involved? Uh, for a number of reasons. For, for me, it's one. Uh, it's to, you know, we have the, the uh, fr freedoms of free, free software, and uh, what, one of them is to, to, to study the source code. And I think this needs to be, to be done in practice. So I, uh, we need... Uh, people who have the exercise of code somehow. So it's not mm. proprietary, it's not corporate thing, so it's, it's, it's a private thing. And it's also it's a bit of crowdsourcing. I mean, the people out there have lots of different hardware. No developer has access to such a bright, broad variety of hardware. And if people have that in test patches or fixed drivers, which does not work on their specific laptop or whatever, this is really helpful to have a, a good and stable and major Linux kernel. You talked before about there being a thousand developers on the kernel at the moment. Um, that has to lead to conflict sometimes. Does that put people off? There is one of the myths that kernel developers are maybe arrogant or grumpy. Some of them are, but that's, <laughs> that's quite normal. I mean, if, you have, if, if you have 1,000 people around you, you have a high chance that some of them are grumpy, be yeah. kernel developers or I, I don't know what. And uh, but the general uh, thing is that you, you you work on a technical level, and if if you remind people, even if if you something looks like it goes into a flame war, remind people that all of us are working uh, to to create a very good operation system and uh, maybe the best in the world. And so, okay, let's get back. Uh, what do we need? How we can we solve it? What are our approaches? What where do we disagree? Where do we agree? and you um, can find a solution. But I want to express that most of the time it was fun for me developing, working with people over well, crossing borders, be company borders or, or uh, countries, working with people in China, talking with them how to fix bugs. That's, that's a really fun thing to do.
Do you find that there is um, some tension between people from different companies, or do they all generally get on okay most of the time? Uh, Sometimes, some. It, it looks like there could be tension, but in general, it's, it's working perfectly. The pe- there are people working from companies you know are competitors in most areas, but on the on the kernel side, they're working together to get the problem done. So if I have got a, a bug, say, with a network card driver in my computer and I am a C developer or at least have C skills to be able to try and fix it, I think I've fixed it, I've developed a, a patch. How do I go about getting that into the kernel? What should I do? Uh, there's documentation about that even inside the kernel. There's a file called Submitting Patches, which clearly describes uh, what to do. Um, the first thing is to, to find out which people lists and people to send it to there's also a script helping you to identify the people um then there's it's about sending it properly no line breaks and whatever and then just uh, be persistent be there if there are questions fix it discuss your solution uh if there's no response which what sadly happens because people are overloaded then just be politely persistent, ask a week or two weeks later, hey, I got this patch, it really solves a problem for me, any commands, um, and yeah, be there to to respond to this, to that, and sooner or later you will have your patch on the mainline kernel. So if you submit some, uh, a patch and there isn't something quite right about it, hopefully somebody will give you some feedback and say, this is good, but you need to do this, that, and the other to fix it and make sure it's up to our standards before it will get in. Yes, um, uh, there's a variety of how people do things. Some really point out you have to do this and this and give you a step-by-step description. Uh, Others give you only pointers where you can have a look how to do it properly. In in some rare cases, uh, they also fix it for you because sometimes it's faster to fix it yourself than to explain someone how to do it. But you still see the results and can learn from that. And uh, yeah, that's usually the way it goes. I mean, it's, it's helpful to educate people. It's, mm. uh, cool. So the kernel uses a, a program called Git to manage its version control, so code and patches and that sort of thing. Uh, how much work do you need to put in to learn that before you can start development? If you want to get into kernel development, you don't really need Git. It, it's just one one tool. You can you can simply go to the to the kernel org website download the tarball and, and work on that source code. I would recommend using some kind of source code management, but you can start with something easily accessible like uh, Quilt or Quilt. And um, keep if you keep at it and you get more uh, kernel stuff done, then you will probably feel the need to do, have something more advanced and then you just slip into, into Git and, and learn the basics and, and the stuff you need, but learning by doing. And then you will find out that it's... Uh, not impossible to master. It might be a, a, a learning curve at the beginning, which is a bit steep, but not, nothing which cannot be managed. Cool. You talked before about um, sometimes not getting a, a reply because people are overloaded and overworked. Is that, a, is that a problem? Are there not enough people working on the kernel at the moment? There are a lot of people working on the uh, kernel at the moment, and that's where I see a potential problem coming up because we get, have a i see an increase in people working producing code producing patches which is is rising because sometimes there's these uh, r and d developments from from bigger companies but the amount of people who review patches who accept patches and maintainers are not uh, the amount of people are not increasing in the same rate so that does not scale too well in my opinion and I think we need to pay attention how to uh, properly deal with it so patches get accepted in an acceptable amount of time. Who drives the direction of the kernel? Who decides what features are going to get included and what isn't appropriate for inclusion? Uh, the first is the maintainer of the subsystem. So if somebody wants an, a new feature in the I2C subsystem or I2C driver, then uh, I'm going. I'm going to decide if that's needed or not. After a discussion of on the list, maybe p- sometimes I've been convinced to, to accept something, 
And uh, then I pass it on to the next level. And in my case, I uh, send a pull request directly to Linus Torvalds and um, he can decide to have another look or not. Uh, usually he trusts the people he get pull requests from, but w he also skims through the change logs and what happens. And he still can reject something if he doesn't like it. And uh, if, But if he's okay, it, it will end up in history and then it's in, in the mainline Linux kernel. So how do you make a decision if uh, a feature should be included in the subsystem that you maintain? Um, it's a bit... Uh, I'm, I must see a need f for that. Uh, there is a da sometimes a danger of over-engineering stuff. So if there's a feature going to be submitted, I definitely need a user of that feature. Mm. And then I have a use case, and then I can decide, okay, I think this is a reasonable approach or not. This is this has also to do with experience, and um, as I said before, it's also the end. Uh, it's the outcome of a discussion. If I think this is not needed, then people describe the use case, and I might be convinced. So there's a new kernel every three months, I think. Uh, how does that process work? How do you decide what's going to go into the next kernel release? The process is like this: uh, after some kernel was released. Uh, for the next kernel, there's something called a merge window, which is roughly about two weeks. And only in that time, um, new features are allowed, new fe really new features or massive changes. And then we have two have a ha roughly about two and a half months until the final uh, kernel comes out, and this is the stabilization phase. In that phase, only bug fixes are accepted to, g to get all the new features properly done and, and make sure there are no regressions and a lot of time is spent into into that to ensure that we have a stable kernel released when it is due. Yeah. So the two week window is a busy period? It, yeah, extremely busy because uh, everyone is uh, paying attention that his changes are um, going into the mainline kernel and then you sometimes have cross dependencies between all the subsystems and they need to be sorted and you have to pay attention that the merge conflicts get solved properly and and yeah all that there is there's something called linux next which ha helps makes it easier because you can always anticipate in linux next what is going to happen but still the uh, merge window is a really really busy period for maintainers I was just going to ask, what does happen if you have a, a development that touches a number of different subsystems? Do, do the maintainers of those subsystems you know, communicate about the, whatever the feature is and make sure that it's not going to break other parts? or How does that work? Yeah, there's a lot of communication needed and it's um, usually you're not allowed to touch or to change something in a subsystem for which is not yours. If you want to do that, you need... Uh, a special acknowledge from the maintainer of that subsystem. So, and that's part of the discussion. Which tree is this massive change touching a lot of things going in? Okay, we decide on yours, and I give you my acknowledge. Okay, you have you can you can change uh, files in my subsystem. I'm okay with them. Cool. So after two and a half months of stabilization and bug fixes, that becomes a, a release, and it, Linus makes that decision. Yeah, and. Uh, there are no strict rules about being exactly two and a half months. He, he needs to have a feeling that this kernel feels good. And oh no, there's still that problem. I, 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 let's try another week of stabilization. And well, he, he then decides, okay, it's out now. A new merge window is opened. Cool. So if somebody out there is listening to this and thinks, oh, I'd like to, like to have a go developing things in the kernel or fixing bugs or whatever it might be, what's the first thing they should do? What website should they go to? What mailing list should they sign up to? Um, the first thing would be to get uh, some source code for the kernel that could be a tar tarball, which is on kernel.org, or they check out the Git repository, which is also on git.kernel.org, probably uh, the Linux repository. And uh, I, if, they, if people wonder where should I start, I uh, mostly suggest uh, scratch the thing which are itching you. Mm -hmm. So if you have a button on your laptop which does not work properly, try that because that keeps the motivation high to really get something done. Mm. Something like that. Excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed for talking to me and uh, best of luck with all the future kernel development. Thank you very much and thanks for the interview. <laughs> Now 
it's time for a bit about Ubuntu. Go! <laughs> Nobody is going to give you the pleasure of an ecosphere or Gerald. Yay! So Ubuntu 12.10, the Quantal Quetzal, except there, has been, the quick, quick quack, has <laughs> been released. <laughs> Yay! Cool, has anyone Excellent. used it yet? Uh I have not. It just it, finished downloading last night, so we haven't tried it yet. Okay. Yeah. I, I normally, I, I like to be a, a bit ahead of the curve and uh, have a have my mirror running for a few weeks before, so it doesn't hit the uh, thing on release day. But I forgot, so and anyway, when the announcement release hit the news, did I remember that I hadn't done it? So we have now got it available to install. Our mirror at work got overloaded. Some <laughs> Debian users got very unhappy that they couldn't get their updates because everyone was upgrading to Ubuntu. Well, upgrading Ubuntu, rather. Yes. Is that mirror.ac.uk? Or no. is that a local mirror? That's a local mirror. Right, okay. <laughs> uh, well, Excellent. as local as you get. Um, anyway, yeah, Canonical has released a web interface for Juju. Yeah, this looks really quite nice, actually. Um, Explain Juju briefly. Juju is basically a, a nice way of packaging scripts which set up servers for you on top of... Um, well, ideally on top of OpenStack. Yeah. So you can have an OpenStack um, server room or data center, um, and you can say, I want, um, I don't know, five web servers with a load balancer in front and a MySQL backend, and it'll go boop, 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 and set it all up for you. It's like apt-get, but for cloud servers. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. For the cloud. We interviewed uh, George Should Castro yes. about it mm. um, earlier this season, I think. I yes. think so, yes. when we were at Mark's, Mark's house. house. Yes, yes. Studio J. C. Um, <laughs> Studio F, you know. <laughs> um, but yes. yes, so this is cool because it means that now people don't have to be comfortable with the command line to be able to set up servers. And it looks quite pretty. So it you does. can see a little graph of uh, which services are installed where and what they're doing. And Got lines and boxes thing. put in a pretty way. Yeah. Hmm. So, yes, no, it's good to see that. Um, and it was one of the things that Mark Shuttleworth was talking a lot, uh, a lot about at SkyCon a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it is one of the major parts of the uh, Ubuntu platform yeah. strategy going forward, <laughs> as they would say. <laughs> <laughs> when does the check come through? going forward <laughs> yeah um mark shuttleworth speaking of whom uh, has announced that ubuntu 1304 so that's the next release will be called the raring ringtail and the upcoming development cycle will have a big focus on the move to mobile tablet and tv form factors uh, there also have been some hints and glimpses of ubuntu running on google's nexus 7 tablet which is quite exciting because I'm holding one of those in my hand. Not running Ubuntu at the moment. Not as of yet. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like um, UDS, which is next next week. week yeah, there's going to be um, some more details arriving then. By the sound of it, mm. yes, the UDS now really is a thing where people announce stuff. Mm. It's um, a bit like an Apple conference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, but yes. Yeah, so, so rather than kind of used to be sort of lots of people sitting in rooms talking about things, and it still is that, but there's this whole extra thing of the attention to paid to the keynotes and stuff, and mm. the idea that some things are going to be released or revealed. Um, yeah, so the ringtail is a type of uh, raccoon. Raccoon, yes. But didn't that makes call sense. It a ringtail, uh, the raring ringtail raccoon, because that's too long. Mm. Too many R's. Three R's. Yeah, you got to be careful. And Simon Redmond says he's just been to New Kizu and there's not a ringtail in sight. Oh. Disappointing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, the team that works on Ubuntu TV have called for more active participation from the community. Ooh. They've set up a website and everything. Ooh. And we'll so, link to it. Okay, so what are they looking for people to do? That's stuff. I think they want people to, like, you know, install it on the box connected to their TV and play around with it and give feedback and work on stuff. Well, they specifically want help with three things at the moment. Um, one is recreating the TV user interface using the Nux toolkit, which ah, is part of, course, of Unity it's been D. using um, QML up until now, hasn't it? Indeed. Which is what 2D. U Unity 2D used, which is now going away. Yeah. Uh, okay. So they want the 3D, fully 3D version. Uh, integrating a Myth TV backend into the TV UI, meaning live TV tuning, uh, the uh, program guide, electronic program guide, and recording infrastructure, which is quite interesting that they're using Myth TV or at least making it possible to use Myth TV as a back end because mm. I, I would have thought they would have probably written their own from scratch. But uh, Myth TV works. Yeah, why well, you do it, that when it does, but it's quite complicated. 
Uh, but if they tricky. could take the bits that they need, yeah, if they can make it smooth, then get rid of the UI. <laughs> That yeah. would be great. <laughs> so it's, the set, it's, it's not the front end UI on Myth TV. It's the it's the setup, oh, and the right. tuners, and the program oh, guides, course, and yeah. data sources and stuff. Anyway, looking for help doing that and researching and finalizing the hardware acceleration of GStreamer video syncs for NVIDIA, Intel, and AMD graphics cards, enabling uh, not only enabling the TV to have hardware accelerated video playback, which is pretty much uh, a must. Yeah. For uh, for Freeview, particularly HD, um, but also anything on the Ubuntu desktop that is built using GStreamer. So there you go. So if you're interested in getting involved in any of those three things, you can uh, find out more on the website, which we will link to from our show notes. Mm. Um, as Windows XP approaches end of life, Canonical's been pitching Ubuntu as an alternative upgrade path to Windows 8. Yes, quite blatantly. Yes, <laughs> so quite as in literally the website says, avoid the pain of Windows 8, Ubuntu. Yes. They don't go in for subtle. No. <laughs> Windows 8 is coming. If you want to avoid it, then, you know, mm. do this I did Ubuntu actually, thing. I saw quite an interesting sort of um, tour of the user interface of Windows 8 saying how similar a lot of the um, the things were to Windows 3.1 in terms <laughs> really? of, uh, it, you know, there's not a start menu anymore, but you can go through programs and create your own shortcuts and pin them to the taskbar yourself like oh. you used to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And how the, like... Because uh, completely unrelated, there was a video of someone upgrading through every version of Windows ever and showing how it all works and how like apps from really early Windows yeah. versions still run on the modern um, versions of Windows. Okay. But the new the calendar app in Windows 8 requires a Microsoft account, whereas the calendar from Windows 3.1, which still runs on Windows 8, doesn't require a Microsoft account. <laughs> Interesting. So somebody's actually got some hardware that they can upgrade everything from 3.1. Mm. No, it was from Windows from, from, from Windows DOS, 1. Install Windows 1, upgrade right. all the wow. way through, skipping out um, ME because there was no upgrade. Right. Path it was through just ME. kind of the, the poor cousin, wasn't it? That yeah. Everybody ignored. So you went 98 to 2000 or 98 to yeah. XP, presumably. Yeah. To 2000 yeah. to XP, yes. Okay. Cool. Excellent. Anyway, back to Ubuntu. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the point. Um, <laughs> The developer of Ubuntu Tweak, which is the utility for customising Ubuntu, various settings and things that are hidden under the covers, uh, announced that he was going to be stopping development on the project because he had uh, other things to do with his time, basically, um, but was encouraged to keep it alive after an outcry from the community. Um, so that's good in a way. Mm. As long as he can keep the enthusiasm that he got from the outcry. Yeah, I think it's obviously been a bit of a shot in the arm for him to keep going. Yeah. Um, you know, and if people actually do use it, and you don't always see that if you're yeah. developing an open source product. Exactly. I mean, yeah, having been in a similar situation myself where I've developed something and just sort of let it sit, actually having people come along and say, oh, yeah, we use it, it's great, is a real sort of driver to get you to carry on doing yeah. stuff with it. It would be better, of course, to build up uh, a full kind of community yes. around it. so other people who can... Take it Do over. the work. Because exactly. <laughs> basically the thing is he's got a job, a full-time job now, and mm. hasn't got as much time to give to this community project, which is fair enough. And, um, you know, it isn't going to change. Yeah. It's just at some point he'll want to do other things with his time, I guess. Mm. But, you know, good while it lasts, and hopefully other people can get involved. And Ubuntu GNOME Remix 12.10 has been released. Yes, yeah, so this is a, um, a full-on remix of... Ubuntu using GNOME 3 instead of Unity. Yes. Uh. Which is interesting for the Unity haters. Yeah. You can become GNOME haters as well. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, it's very different from GNOME 2. So, you know, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> and we have some not about Ubuntu news. Um, yes. Couple Sorry. A couple of it's, Fedora yes, stories. Facts about Fedora, I think I'll call it. Ooh. Um, For, fedora fun. Yes. Fedora had um, uh, a, a tool called Smolt, which was uh, a system for um, like doing a census of the hardware that it was being run on. Yeah. Um, and they're retiring that because they don't think it's the right way of doing it. Which is currently. interesting. Yes. Because Ubuntu does thinks that's the right way to do it yes so, so does ubuntu get a higher share than fedora on this tool it yeah i don't think they use the same tool i think it's just the way the methodology for gathering the hardware data <laughs> hmm. i don't think it's like oh this tool is no longer giving us the results we need let's stop using it <laughs> um no, yeah i didn't really think they did but it's quite amusing <laughs> still <laughs> okay and also in the fedora world the uh release of fedora 18 has been delayed by another week 
Apparently, it's been delayed by several weeks already. Yeah, apparently they're focusing... It's not ready yet. Stop. <laughs> this distro is not ready yet. Um, they are getting their developers to focus on the upcoming Red Hat Enterprise Linux release uh-huh. um, uh-huh. rather than Fedora. What number is that? And apparently, imagine this, apparently they can't do the release without the Red Hat people uh, facilitating it. What, mm. Fedora? Mm. Aren't most of the sort of developers on Fedora Red Hat people? That was my understanding. Well, kind of, yeah. Like, you couldn't do a release of Ubuntu without the canonical people. I know, that was my point. Oh, I see. But, you know, compared but, with... But canonical... Well, there there is only one Ubuntu. There's not a separate one which the canonical people are more interested in. Yeah, yeah. It was just interesting to see how the... Um, the, uh, the, corporate uh, the, the corporate side. stuff can influence the progress of the community distro mm. Fedora. Yeah. But, yeah, there's always been a really close link there. Anyway, um... That's all we have in the bit about Ubuntu and not about Ubuntu this time. Now it's time for your feedback. <laughs> and <Good> uh, oh. <laughs> Wub wrote in to say, I have approximately two cents with a response to Tony's, I think it was Tony's, question about whether new users would be put off by the appearance of ads on their brand new shiny homepage. My thinking runs something like this. <laughs> At an earlier point in the podcast, Tony pointed out a distinction between ad-supported software and the shopping filter that, as far as I understand the argument, hinges on whether the underlying mechanism serving the ads is profiling the search terms or not. How is the average u- new user going to be able to evaluate that? I feel that they are simply going to see that their desktop is serving them ads that seem to be related to all the searches they are doing. This would probably strike me in much the same way as ads inside a game I was playing, in the sense that I wasn't necessarily expecting them, don't understand why this game has ads when other games don't, and can't turn them off. I believe that this would make Ubuntu appear cheap, as every search I make, even inside my local drive, is somehow being monetized. Whether that is a fair impression or represents Canonical's actual intentions is not for me to say. I will say that I departed from Ubuntu when Linux Mint 12 was released. Can I just say, Tony isn't the wing commander? (laughs) So I think he fancies himself as that. I was just... Um, I can suggest suggest (laughs) how a um, a user might evaluate what they're doing with the data because there's... There's a, a thing on the dash, you click a link and it tells you. Oh, right. Alan told us about that last week, I think. Right. They added it after people were saying, oh, privacy concerns, what's going on? And it'll oh, explain yes. where your data goes and you, you can turn it off. It's like a legal notice yes, thing, Yes, that's isn't the it? one. Yeah, that's the one. Right, then, yes. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's an inter- it's, it is an interesting point, uh, I think, about making it appear cheap. Like as it's an ad-supported software. Mm. Mm. Um, Not in the same way as Opera or whatever with an ad bar in the menu, in the the toolbar as it used to have. Um, But yeah, I wonder whether there's an impression that people might get erroneously. Well, it's free, but you know. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, it is cheap. It's very, very cheap. Yeah. But it's trying to compete with less cheap software. Mm. Ben Dowell says... I realise I'm too late for the competition, but my suggestion to improve Ubuntu would be to make speed dial like copy and move to locations, which can be easily assigned for quick file sortation without multiple open windows via the right click. Does anyone... No, no. no. Okay. Thank you for your suggestion. I ran Ubuntu 12.04 from a 16 gig micro flash drive and love the way it will switch between laptop and netbook or any other computer I wish to run and still have plenty of room for user files. A very cheap way to speed up an old netbook and a really portable environment. Thanks, Ubuntu. Well, that's an interesting idea. I know people who used to use, um, what was the KDE Live CV? Nopix. Nopix. You yes. used to use Nopix and a USB stick yes, as their I used kind to of do portable that. environment. Did you? Oh, yeah. right. Okay. And Alan has that little tobacco tin with a million USB <laughs> yes. sticks, which he can, uh, yeah. depending on what he needs to do with any computer, he can just sort of plug in various things. And oh, I forgot yeah. that he had that. I haven't seen that in a while. Mm. I he think it's in his smoking. big box of tools. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it's good to see that that is a usable solution, the fact mm. you can have it all in one little yeah. tiny... Because you could have that in a teeny tiny little stick these days. Yes, because, yeah, when you um, you net boot in the tool for creating um, 
bootable USB sticks for installing it actually has an option if you're using a, an Ubuntu ISO to create some space for you to save your files to as well yeah alongside the live system which is quite cool interesting stuff scott hewitt has written in to say on 27th and 28th of october adam jansh and i are planning on carrying out a 24-hour commentary on the hack manchester event online via a stream um, slash google hangout you can find out more about hack manchester uh, at the hack manchester website which is hackmanchester.com <laughs> we'll put a link in the show notes um yeah well, good luck, Scott and Adam. 24 hours broadcasting um, is a Yeah, you will catch us doing that. <laughs> no way. <laughs> we struggled to make it through an hour. Yeah. <laughs> We've had to eat two lots of cake already this evening. Yeah. Imagine there's not enough cake in the world to get us through a 24-hour show. <laughs> or tea. Yeah, or tea, yeah. Um, Open Energy Monitor tweeted, Does anyone know if Sage Instant Accounts 2012, brackets version 18, close brackets, runs on Ubuntu under Wine? Um, I can tell you where to look. If you go to appdb.winehq.com, that might be .org, um, <laughs> and search for Sage Instant Accounts 2012, you'll find out. Yes, that's usually the first place to look. Or just try it. Or just try it, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's Wine's pretty good these days. Wine and then the install name, installer executable yeah. name, see how far you get. Or just um, double-click the exe file. Yeah, if you, do that? Oh, yeah. Cool. if you if yeah on if you do a go on WineDB, it sometimes tells you there's a there's another little um, command line tool called Wine Tricks, which will do things like install .NET and install Visual C plus plus and other sort of underlying runtime stuff which it might need, and people tend to document that on Wine HQ. So cool. that might be a good place to look. Excellent. Russell Phillips tweeted, "I've just found about out about about." Yeah. I've you just, even got to the hard that's bit, 140 yeah. characters already there I, i've just found out about coda dojo coda dojo oh. worth mentioning on the podcast and that's coda dojo.com yes it is worth mentioning on the what's podcast coda, thank you for mentioning it what's a coda dojo then mark uh, a coda dojo joe do, <laughs> i'm not joe uh, is um <laughs> it's good thing he's not called joe it's a, a sort of non-profit um movement or not for profit i'm not sure exactly a which non-profit not for profit nom, not nom, for profit nom, oh, okay. um uh, which is about sort of um, organising workshops for kids to learn how to program. So they sort of oh, match yeah. up mentors with people who want to learn and do stuff with them to teach them, sort of like young rewired state sort of thing, but not specifically focusing on open data stuff, I suppose. Yeah, oh, sounds really cool. cool. And there's quite a lot of them. It seems to be enormous in Ireland. There seems to be one everywhere in Ireland and quite a few in the US um, and some in London, but not very widely dispersed in the uk other than that unfortunately mm. well cool. uh, thanks for uh, pointing that out to us russ and uh, if you're interested find out more codadojo.com <laughs> Well, that is all for this episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, which is at the following address, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And on that website, you can find our voicemail numbers where you can send us messages using Skype or SIP or a plain old telephone. Um, you can find our Twitter feed, our Facebook, and even a Google Plus page and details of our IRC channel where there's some dedicated people hanging out all the way through the week wanting to talk about this show actually they talk about other stuff mostly um but yeah let us know what you think of this show or give us your thoughts about ubuntu and the community that makes it uh, you can join us again on tuesday the 6th of november for our next live broadcast what's happening on that show do we know um it's my half birthday your half. <laughs> so we get extra cake yes birthday I think so. cake super engineer in the rc channel just said argos use nopix he also said it's a secret Whoops. Oh. Was I not supposed to say that? I wonder what they use it for. Um, Booting machines. Do you think their, their stop think. control system runs on Nopix? It's think actually it. just a live CD. <laughs> I can't think of anything funny enough in the short enough time. So we can say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.